Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. It's the preview show and we're going to be looking ahead to Arsenal's Premier League fixture versus West Ham United at the weekend. On this episode, we're going to be touching on the stats and the recent results between the two sides. We're going to be getting the West Ham view from James Jones of We Are West Ham, the podcast. Uh, we're going to be talking about Lucas Torreira's injury. I'll be giving you my starting 11 and prediction. We'll be touching briefly on the FA Cup draw, the fact that the man Manchester City fixture has been rescheduled and how unfair it is to the supporters and we'll be taking some of your comments and questions towards the end. So without further ado let's have a look at the statistics between the two clubs. Now of course Arsenal went um, to, uh, well, I almost said Upton Park there, to the London Stadium, um, as it is called, uh, earlier on in the season and of course Freddie Lundberg was in charge that day and the Gunners ran out uh, as the winners uh, after a pretty poor first half display, Arsenal sort of burst into life after going a goal down. And of course, uh, Gabriel Martinelli was the catalyst to that comeback there. Nicolas Pepe got a goal, as did uh Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, I believe. Yeah, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. Uh, so that was Arsenal's last uh, trip uh, to West Ham and it was the last time the two clubs met. Prior to that, we were beaten at... Um, the London Stadium. That was on Sunday, the 12th of January, 2019. I was at that game. I think it was Declan Rice that got the goal for the Hammers that day. But other than that, we've been uh, pretty good against West Ham. We beat them at the Emirates Stadium at the start of last season by three goals to one. Um, the, the back end of the season before that, there was a 4-1 victory uh, at the Emirates. And then, of course, there was that uh, nil-nil draw at Upton Park in December 2017. So the record between the two clubs um, is is very slanted in Arsenal's favour and it is in general when you're talking about the Premier League the sides have met 47 times Arsenal have won 30 of those West Ham United have won just 8 and there's been 9 draws between the two so Arsenal of course have the far superior record in the Premier League uh, when it comes to this fixture now if we look at the recent form of the two sides Arsenal are unbeaten in their last 5 Premier League games but the problem has been there have been way too many draws the Gunners have drawn 3 of their last five we drew against Sheffield United uh, at the Emirates Stadium 1-1 uh, we drew away at Chelsea 2-2 which felt like a victory but it only gave us one point in the end um, as draws do and then there was the draw at Burnley 0-0 but since then we've turned a little bit of a corner in terms of our Premier League form uh, convincing 4-0 win over Newcastle United and then a 3-2 victory over Everton over Carlo Ancelotti's Everton who are uh, very resurgent and uh, look a far better side than they did under Marco Silva so um, you know things are, are looking on the up for Arsenal but then of course we suffered that major disappointment in the Europa League elimination at the hands of Olympiacos which I don't think anybody saw coming but that has had a massive effect on Arsenal's chances of reaching the Champions League next season and that can in turn have a huge effect on our transfer budget and on how we proceed and, and the futures of the likes of Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang for instance so not ideal really really disappointing result but um, ultimately is something that we've just got to move on from and there is a chance that we can make it via the league there is a chance that we can put a run of results together and get ourselves right back in the mix there is inconsistency all around this division and Arsenal should and can um, you know take advantage of it if only they get their own house in order so uh, looking at the season so far comparing Arsenal's to West Ham United's where Arsenal are in 10th at the moment West Ham in 16th um, Arsenal have won eight of their games uh, West Ham have won seven so just one fewer and believe it or not just having one win less they actually find themselves in a relegation battle and it just goes to show um how important it is not to lose games in this division. And Arsenal haven't done that too often this season in their defence. They've only lost six, but draws have been the problem. 13 draws for the Gunners so far. On average, Arsenal score 1.44 goals per match compared to West Ham United's 1.25. We've kept six clean sheets, as have they. Um, and Arsenal... Actually, going by the Premier League's official statistics, create an average uh, of just... 1.3 chances per match compared to West Ham's 1.32. So they're in the lead in that department. Again, these are the Premier League's official statistics. Um, 
you know, what do you class as a clear cut chance? Is it got to be clear cut for you to to class it as a chance in this? I don't know. I don't know how they measure this. So I'd be a little bit cautious of that one, if I'm honest. But in terms of uh, top players in, involved in this fixture, in terms of goals, Pierre Emerick Aubameyang is way out in front. 17 goals in the Premier League this season uh, for Arsenal's star man and Arsenal's captain nowadays. West Ham's Sebastian Haller has seven, and he's the closest player uh, to Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang in that particular area. In terms of tackles, well, that's one that West Ham lead the way in. Declan Rice has completed 85 tackles or has made 85 tackles. Ryan Fredericks is second with 63. And one that surprises me a little bit in third is Felipe Anderson, not a player known for his defensive ability. So I was kind of surprised to see that one. I've got to be honest. Um, we're going to take a short break and you'll be hearing from James Jones of We Are The West Ham Podcast and uh, he'll be filling you in on the team, um, how they've been getting on of late and the, the general mood around the club. So you should provide some excellent insight. Enjoy. I'm delighted to say that joining me on the line is James Jones of We Are West Ham Podcast. I hope I've said that right, James, have I? We, we yeah, Are West Ham yeah, Podcast. Perfect brilliant yeah. lovely James welcome back we've had you on the Chronicles of Aguna before actually it's been quite a while though since we last spoke on here um wanted to get your take on West Ham of course Arsenal's uh, upcoming opponents this weekend we're expecting a difficult game it's at the Emirates Stadium but we expect a uh, a certain level of uh, effort from a David Moyes team big result for you guys last weekend have you taken confidence from that yeah, I think we've we've taken uh, confidence. Uh, we still have taken confidence from the defeat at Liverpool a couple of Mondays ago. You know, we not many teams go to Anfield and, and score two goals. Um, I know that they're a little bit out of form at the moment, Liverpool, but they're still the best the best team in the world. Um, and so we could take a lot of a lot of positives from that performance. David Moyes has started to play a little bit more of a, of a positive and attacking style of football. Um, and it seems to be working wonders, you know. I know we only beat Southampton at the weekend, but to us, that's, that's a massive game, given the situation that we're in. And Jared Bowen has been, has been seems like he could be a fantastic signing from Hull. Um, you know, Halle looks like he's playing well. Uh, Antonio looks like an absolute beast again, like he used to be. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty confident now going into this relegation battle compared to maybe three weeks ago when I thought we were dead and buried. Absolutely. And it, it, it's sad to see a club of, of West Ham's size even be involved in a relegation battle. And I'm not saying that I'm not being, you know, I'm not taking the mickey or having fun. I'm just, for me, I find it strange that a club with such a huge fan base that have made quite significant investment over the last few years find themselves in this position. Did they hang on to Manuel Pellegrini too long, in your opinion? I don't think you can say they hung on for too long. I mean, if they did, it would have been by maybe a couple of months. Uh, it wasn't like, you know, oh, they should have got rid of him after the first season. It like, maybe not even a couple of months, you know. We had a good start to the season under Pellegrini. We went up after losing the first game to City 5-0. You know, we went, I think, seven games unbeaten in the league. We were fourth in September. Um, so, you know, the start to the season was good. But then Fabianski got injured and it all fell apart. And it was all a little bit weird that, you know, our goalkeeper gets injured and suddenly we can't win a football match. Um, so I wouldn't go to say we kept on and kept out holding for too long, but um, yeah, it's, it's really difficult to put our finger on exactly why it went wrong and where it went wrong. Um, but we are where we are now, and we've kind of just got to get on with it. Absolutely. And, and talking about David Moyes, because he's a manager that I guess people on the outside love to make fun of, and that's kind of been the case ever since he took that Manchester United job. It was a massive job. It didn't go to plan. He, he moved to Spain for a while and people were taking the mickey out of his Spanish as well. And he just became yeah. this figure, didn't he, where people would point and laugh at him. But he's a very astute manager. For me, he's, he, he gets the basics done. He makes sure that his teams work hard. They're very well organised. Mikel Arteta has been talking about him in his press conference as well and that he admires him as a man and that he's very organised and that he's got a very strong character. Were West Ham maybe wrong to, to move him on in the first place? Because obviously he had a previous spell at the London Stadium and everybody was kind of, I don't know, looking at it from the outside, it felt like people were turning their noses up at him because of the way he likes to play football. But in harsh reality, 
and again, I don't mean this in a bad way, but where are West Ham at? And maybe was David Moyes a better option than trying to make that step up and ended up in the position you're in now? Yeah, I mean, it's quite easy to, you know, in hindsight, say in hindsight, we should have kept hold of it. I think at the time, you know, there was a lot of fan unrest. You know, it wasn't long after, you know, those protests that we saw with the fans on the pitch with the corner flag and the Burnley game and, you know, fans trying to get into the director's box. And it took over at a time back then when, you know, very similar to now, um, but, you know, the fans weren't happy about the direction in which the football club was going, going in, particularly on the back of a stadium move which no one really liked. Um, and it was difficult for David Moyes to come in and actually do a job. He did a job, but then the fans were like, well, hang on, we moved to the stadium. Uh, you said world-class stadium for a world-class team. We're not going to have a world-class team with someone like David Moyes in charge. And that's probably quite unfair on David Moyes, really. But the fans wanted a big name, a big name manager. So the club went and got Pellegrini. Um, that didn't work. Uh, it looked like it might do it at times, but it didn't work. The problem we've got now is that the club have gone well. David Moyes wasn't the right man 18 months ago. So why do you think he's the right man now? Um, that's why the fans are a little bit frustrated. But we don't blame David Moyes. Do you know what? He's, he's, he's beginning to turn it around. As, we, as I said before, you know, beginning to take a little bit more positivity in the performances. I mean, you can turn it around. Um, and I don't think the fans are really against David Moyes at the moment. It's more more the owners. Uh, and you know, I do feel a bit sorry for him because he gets a lot of unwarranted stick. As you said before, he became a meme for a good four or five years, didn't he? Absolutely. Uh, after that, after that Man United stint, um, there's a reason why he was given that job at Man United is because he was a very good manager. It didn't work out for him, and then I think the jobs that he took after that were kind of a byproduct of how that Man United job affected him. Maybe he can kind of redeem himself at West Ham if he's allowed to stay on beyond this season. Um, he's got an 18 month contract, but. Um, but yeah, it is a difficult one. Uh, in hindsight, perhaps we should have kept him, but you just never know, do you? Absolutely. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. And, and we're a club that knows all about being sort of disconnected from the owners, not agreeing with the direction in which they're taking what they see as a business. But to us, it's our football club. So, uh, you know, mm-hmm. complete sympathy from you guys. Just one final point that I wanted to, to bring you up on. I wanted to ask you, actually. I, whenever I talk to West Ham fans, the, the subject that always comes up is the London Stadium. You know, there's always yeah. this thing about we shouldn't have moved there and, you know, they've taken away, sort of ripped out the heart of our club and moved us there. For me, people call it a soulless bowl and I think that is what it is. I went there last season when you guys beat us, incidentally, and that's how I found it. But I find that problem with lots of the modern stadiums. It's not just the London Stadium. So what I wanted to ask you is, is it still an issue to you or is it something that West Ham have to just look at and say, right, we're here now and we just have to make the best of it and we have to stop using it as an excuse because for me, it feels like it's being used as a bit of an excuse and West Ham are not the only club, uh, you know, this is not me having a go at West Ham. Lots of clubs that move stadiums have this thing where they say, oh, we should have stayed where we were. Is it just time to just park that and just get on with it? Uh, I mean, again, hindsight, um, you know, you look back now and go, yeah, we probably should have stayed at Upton Park. Um, but at the time, the way that that move was being sold to the fans, it was, this is going to be the best thing since last spread. This is going to push West Ham into a completely different level than we, than we used to. It's going to be fantastic. Um, it's not a football stadium is, is the, is the crux of it. A lot of clubs will move into new stadiums that are, are specially built for football because of the way that it was built for the London Olympics um, and it was never planned to actually be turned into a football stadium afterwards, unlike, say, City Stadium after the Commonwealth. Yeah. Um, it was very difficult to, to then suddenly turn it into uh, an arena that was good enough to host football and sort of um, from a, not just from like just on the pitch, but from a fan's perspective as well and actually make the fans still have a connection with the players up to park, we were so close to the pitch, um, and now we're quite a lot further away. Um, so yeah, I don't think we can really use the excuse anymore. I think those excuses, you know, were only really valid for a year, maybe eighteen months, while we got used to playing there. Um, but we've had some big games there. We've beaten pretty much every team there, barring City, I think, and Liverpool. You know, we've beaten Arsenal, we've beaten Spurs there, we've beaten Chelsea there, we've beaten United there. Um, we've had some really big results at that stadium and there's been some really good nights there when there's been some when the atmosphere's been fantastic. So to say that it's it's a constant soulless bow, I think is is a cop out. 
for a lot of West Ham fans that say I'm not saying away fans. Um, and I think we've just got to get on with it now and just hope that when someone buys the football club, they broker a deal where they buy the stadium off the government, we knock it down and we build something that's fit for purpose. Because at the moment, long term, it's not fit for purpose. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Some great points there, James. Thank you so much, my friend. And how do you see the game going on Saturday? Of course, West Ham come to the Emirates Stadium needing the points for very different reasons, but just as important, West Ham obviously um, looking to pull away from the relegation zone. Arsenal trying to to put a run of results together, trying to rally and hoping to to sneak into a European place. How do you see it going? It's a difficult one, as you say, you know, Arsenal are having a bit of a tough time of it, but, you know, still look dangerous, um, can still, you know, put a run of results together while, while we're on the up. Um, we haven't got a great record at the Emirates in, in recent seasons, and um, I don't know, I mean, despite us desperately needing the points, um, and I, hopefully all three points, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be too down high with a draw. And it's, it's, that's the kind of result I can see happening. Um, given, I mean, I don't know what the fans are like at the Emirates in terms of getting behind Arteta and his players at the moment, but I'm judging by the scenes for the Olympiacos game recently. Um, the fans are a little bit disgruntled about what's going on. Um, so maybe we can sort of get in Arsenal's faces early and sort of disrupt the, the atmosphere in the ground and, and maybe sort of spring a surprise. But I think, you know, I think it'll be a tough game for both sides and it'll be you know, a one-all draw. I think we'll probably be sort of not far off. Absolutely. And you make a great point there about the fans at the Emirates. Very quick to get on people's backs. But equally, I have to say, when they are behind the team, they are behind the team. And that's been more yeah. the case under Mikel Arteta because I think he's got a lot more support than Emery had or than, uh, you know, Unai, uh, Arsene Wenger, sorry, had towards the back end of his tenure. So I expect them to get behind them. But like you said, if West Ham get in and amongst Arsenal in the early stages of the game and they make it nervy and they make it difficult then there's a good chance that they can turn that Emirates crowd on the Arsenal fans. Uh, James, thank you so much for your time, my friend. Uh, do you want to let our listeners know how they can find the We Are West Ham podcast and keep up to date with you on social media? Yeah, yeah, of cool. course. So, so we're uh, at We Are underscore West Ham on Twitter. You can, you can tune in live on Love Spot Radio every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock to listen to our show or you can subscribe on sort of all the, the popular and not so popular podcast platforms um, for, for our podcast after that we have a few special episodes as well um, so yeah that's, that's pretty much us we are West Ham brilliant stuff and make sure you guys do head over there and check them out as well and uh, cheers my thanks there to the brilliant James Jones. Do give him a follow. I'm going to look at uh, some of the news that's been coming out of Arsenal Football Club in the last few days. And that is, of course, that Lucas Torreira has broken his ankle or fractured his ankle is the correct term that I should use. Really poor injury suffered in the game against Portsmouth on Monday night in the FA Cup. I've heard people say that it's a clean tackle and there's no issues with it. And at the time... You know, you did get that impression that he got the ball and he did get the ball. I'm not saying he didn't, but I guess the issue for me was the follow through. And I was commentating on the game for Hot Mike and I pointed that out straight away. I said instantly that I didn't like the follow through and I think that's done some serious damage. Of course, Torreira left the stadium on a boot. Then there were reports that he told Uruguayan television that it wasn't as serious as first feared, but it's now been revealed that he has fractured his ankle. We don't know uh, how long he's going to be out for. That remains unclear. Um, so we'll have to wait and see on that one. But that is a huge, huge blow to Arsenal, who, in my opinion, was starting to see not necessarily the best because Danny Sabayos has been doing a really, really good job in that midfield. But I always feel like, particularly in games away from home, um, the, the terreira Xhaka partnership is is the safer option and it's the way to go. I think with Danny Sabayos, he gives you a lot of control in possession and I like that. But I think there are some games where we're still not quite ready to try and dominate games and, and therefore we need to be able to switch in that, to that defensive mode. And I think with Torreira in the side, that is easier to do. Um, so that's a massive, massive blow. And we wish Lucas Torreira a speedy recovery, of course. Now, in light of that, I'm going to bring you on to my starting 11, the starting 11 that I would go with uh, heading into this game. And that is Bernd Leno in goal, a back four of Hector Bayer and David Lewis, Pablo Marie and Bukayo Saka. My midfield pairing would be Danny Ceballos and Granit Xhaka with Mesut Ozil just in front of them. Um, and my front three 
would be Nicolas Pepe, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang through the middle and Reese Nelson from the left because I've been a critic of Reese Nelson at times. I felt that he's not delivered, but he did deliver at Portsmouth. He provided two really good assists and therefore he's earned his place in the team for me. And if you're not going to reward players for performing well, then what's the point? Um, so I think he's he's done enough in that Portsmouth game to suggest that, you know, he deserves a start. And, you know, Gabriel Martinelli did pretty well in that game as well. But I think you've got to be cautious uh, when it comes to burnout, when it comes to the, the young Brazilian, he's still very young. Don't want him to be playing as many games as he is at the moment. Um, so we've got to be cautious with that. But that would mean that Lacazette sits the game out. It would mean that Genduzi sits the game out. It does mean Mustafi and Socrates are left out. But that's my starting lineup. So just to remind you one more time, Bern Leno in goal, Bayer in Luis Marie, Saka across the back, uh, Pablo Marie in there incidentally because I thought he had a very good game at Portsmouth, looked very comfortable and Quite frankly, I want to see him in action against Premier League opposition. Um, and I think a home game against West Ham um, is the type of game that you can throw him into. I say that might be my famous last words, but I do believe um, that Pablo Marie is up to the task and I think he's up to the fitness levels required now. Whether Mikel Arteta believes that playing Monday and Saturday is, is too soon given the level of fitness he was at when he arrived at the club, I don't know. Um, but for me... That would be my selection. So that's my starting 11. Leno, Bellerin, Luis, Marie, Saka, Sabayos, Xhaka, Ozil, Pepe, Aubameyang and Nelson. Um, FA Cup draw was done uh, last night by the time you guys are listening to this, uh, which was uh, after the, the conclusion of... Uh, that those fifth round ties of course Spurs crashed out which was fantastic really enjoyed watching that and and to be fair Norwich deserved it um you know we've spoken time and time again about um you know Jose Mourinho we even spoke about him coming to the Emirates Stadium and there was lots of people behind that idea but ultimately he doesn't seem to know how to get you know that attacking flair, that attacking prowess out of people. And people spoke about when he first arrived at Tottenham that they'd started scoring a lot more goals and that his approach had changed. His approach hasn't changed. His approach hadn't changed. Uh, and it's never going to change for me. Jose Mourinho is a dinosaur, but that's another topic for another day. Um, and of course, it's always great to see that lot crash out uh, of the competition, particularly in that fashion, at home, in front of their own fans, in the, with all the drama that comes from a penalty shootout. Um, of course, Arsenal's fixture against Manchester City um, has been arranged for this coming Wednesday night. And you can catch my commentary via the Hot Mic app if you download the app using the promo code Harry Sim, all in capitals. That's H A R R Y S Y M. You'll be able to sync that commentary to your television set and you'll be able to listen to us rather than the BT Sport commentators, if you wish, of course. Um, but we do really enjoy doing it and we really enjoy having you guys on board. Lots of you are on board for the Portsmouth game and we can't wait to do it again uh, for this Manchester City game. But we've got to talk about how unfair it is on the fans that this game has been scheduled for a Wednesday night. Um, look, I guess we all knew that it was likely to be a midweek fixture because we know that the, the calendar is very tight at the moment. Manchester City's participation in the UEFA Champions League and it looks like they're probably going to progress um, through that tie against Real Madrid as well means that it's difficult to reschedule this game. The weekends are packed. They're fighting on a number of fronts. So it was always going to be midweek. But for me to do it with, with such little notice is problematic because, A, how do people arrange their travel? Um, I, I understand that there's no trains from Manchester back to London after 9.15 p.m., which is no good to anybody. We we understand that the club have put some subsidized, subsidized travel on um for those wishing to make the journey, which helps um, and all credit to the club for that. But this is for me, people talk about this being, you know, a decision that was taken without considering the fans. And that's absolutely what it is. In my opinion, the reason it's been selected for that day on TV um, is a desperate attempt by Sky as well um, to steal away audiences from BT Sport, who, of course, will have all the audiences that night because the UEFA Champions League is on. And Sky are, are, are losing their grip a little bit, if you ask me. I think, you know, it's great that they've got so many Premier League games, but with BT Sport having the European competition, that is a massive tick in their column. Um, and, of course, I think that this is a move... Um, 
that I'm not saying Sky had the final say and that Sky made the decision entirely on their own, but they would have pushed for this, particularly on a night where um, BT Sport were going to be in the limelight. So that's something to consider uh, when thinking about how this has come uh, around. Do not underestimate the power of the television broadcasters and the influence they have over fixture scheduling because it is massive. Um, But like I said, looking forward to that game Come join us on the Hot Mic app. You can join us via the Chronicles of Aguna uh, YouTube channel as well. Uh, but if you join us via the Hot Mic app, you get the full experience with the in-stadium sounds, with everything. It's a proper commentary. And uh, I'll be joined by Mike uh, Stavrou, who regularly joins me on the podcast, to do that. So that should be great fun. Uh, so don't forget to tune in for that. Uh, in terms of a prediction for Saturday's game, I'm going to go for an Arsenal win. I'm feeling positive. I think we have turned the corner in terms of our performances. I I kept saying it afterwards and I'll say it again. I think the Olympiacos result was a fluke. Um, Maybe not a fluke. Maybe a freak result is a better way of putting it. Um, But that's how I felt after that game. And that's how I still feel about it. Yes, I'm massively disappointed. Yes, it was a huge blow to Arsenal season. But we can't get caught up on it. We can't get hung up on it. And we cannot overlook the progress that we've made under Mikel Arteta off the back of one result. So I'm feeling confident. I'm going to go for a narrow Arsenal victory. I'm going to say 1-0 to the Arsenal, that famous old scoreline. Now, uh, let's go over to some correspondence because uh, in light of the news that that Lucas Torreira um, is likely to miss maybe the rest of the season now um, through that fractured ankle injury, I put a, a tweet out via the Chronicles of Aguna's Twitter page. So do follow us at Chronicles underscore FC, uh, AFC, sorry. And ask the question, who should play alongside Xhaka now? Um, in my opinion, it should be Danny Sabales on Saturday. But moving forward, is there a standout candidate for you? Or should it be uh, based on the game, based on the opponent, which is the the approach I would take, I think Sabahs for the home games against the lesser opposition. I think when you go away from home, maybe you need Genduzi's physicality in there. Joe Willock didn't really take his opportunity to shine for me at Portsmouth on Monday night. So he's not in there for me. But I just want to go through what some of you guys have been saying on Twitter when I asked the question. And Demon Guna, big shout out to you, mate. He says all of them. <laughs> um, Byron says Ainsley Maitland-Niles. That's an interesting one. Let me know what you think about that in the comments. Ainsley Maitland-Niles appears to have fallen out of favour under Mikel Arteta and it remains to be seen whether he'll be considered in that midfield role uh, moving forward now that Lucas Torreira has been injured. So we'll have to see on that. Uh, Ivan says Ceballos. Uh, Marcy Steven says David Luiz. And there's another one for Ainsley Maitland-Niles from Guna Michael. Um, Stephen Barton says Ceballos or Luiz. Um, and uh, come on you Gunas, a fan from Germany says Sabios as well. Uh, Eugene, in reference to the challenge um, on Lucas Torreira, says not even a yellow given. Um, Arceta uh, says, fuck Mike Dean, not even a card, bastard. Um, and Darren Dupree actually slightly disagrees and says it was a good tackle. He got the ball first. I think he did get the ball. And I think we've got to be clear on that. And let's not say that this was a malicious challenge, but I think players have to be aware of the damage that their follow through can do in that situation and that you know has ultimately what's done the damage to Lucas Torreira could have been the way he fell as well there's a number of factors it's just a really really unfortunate injury was it a nice tackle no it wasn't but I've seen much worse and I've seen much worse that hasn't resulted in injury. So we've got to put this down to bad luck and we've got to move on from it and we've got to hope that those uh, left behind uh, can fill the void left uh, by Lucas Torreira. Big thanks to all of you for tuning in and, of course, to James Jones of We Are West Ham uh, for joining us and providing some insight around his club as well. Hope you've enjoyed that and we'll be back with some more uh, at the start of next week. We'll be talking about the West Ham game, of course, and looking ahead to that Manchester City fixture. We'll be bringing you the live commentary of uh, Manchester City versus Arsenal on Wednesday and then uh, we'll be looking ahead further after that. So uh, subscribe, share, review, comment do the usual stuff and this podcast is produced by AMS Media for any production needs uh, or social media needs even because we offer social media management head over to AMS Media Limited on Twitter you can find us there you can DM us uh, with your inquiry and we'll come back to you ASAP let's hope for three points and uh, until next time take care come on the Arsenal